Welcome again, everyone, to our Ada J Author New User Webinar. This is Jessica Frank. I'm Ada J Author's Project Manager. So I want to welcome today our guest speaker, Susan Ingalls. Susan is with South Carolina Legal Services. She's the Consumer Law Unit Head and Senior Staff Attorney there. She's here to talk with us about how her team implemented five online classrooms using another Cali tool called LearnTheLaw.org. So LearnTheLaw.org was TIG funded. Um, and it was built with the team in Connecticut, and it's been expanded across the country. And Susan's team in South Carolina was one of the ones who used it pretty robustly. They presented at our Cali conference in June, um, and so I wanted to welcome Susan here to talk about how you can build an online classroom and integrate tools like an A to J guided interview as part of a bigger um, learning experience for self-represented litigants. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan if you want to introduce yourself further or start talking, and I'll flip over to uh, the Learn the Law site. Okay, thanks so much, Jessica. I'm really excited to talk about the Learn the Law platform. Um, we've, you can see here on the screen um, what the platform looks like, and Jessica has put it on one of our actual classrooms that we created. So we'll um, look at that in a little more detail in a minute. I wanted to start by saying how I found out about Learn the Law, um, and as Jessica mentioned, it was uh, created through a TIG grant, and in 2016, um, we had done, I think it was 2016, um, we had done some guided interviews using the A to J author. Um, one of those was in collaboration with our court administration here in South Carolina. And we wanted to do some more uh, because we liked, of course, the platform and we liked the idea of um, more content to help our um, pro se clients that were having to do their own representation to give them a broad range of tools and in very diverse subject matters. And so in conversation with each other, we were looking at how can we address the different learning styles that our clients have and, of course, that the general public had. And, of course, we were hoping to get a TIG grant uh, from LSC. So what we did was to review uh, some of the previous grants. And in that process is really how we found Learn the Law. And so didn't take us too long to see that that was going to be really the perfect way for us to address sort of that desire to include information on a particular legal subject, but in multiple formats. Um, so, you know, we had challenges, of course, um, because although we had started with these five subjects, um, we already had resources on the five subjects that we did, and really the challenge was for us as attorneys how to really put all that together and what to include, and so that was a, a pretty big task, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, I want to you know, highlight, first of all, the collaboration aspect of the project. Um, we had, of course, five lawyers each agreed to create a classroom on a legal subject in our area of focus. And that's crucial to have really, I think, a leader of each classroom because you would think that it wouldn't take long. You've already got some information and resources. Um, but in fact, when we were um, writing our TIG grant, I was told, well, this is a two year project. And in my mind, as just you know, a lawyer, I was like, well, this isn't going to take two years. What do you mean? Well, in fact, it actually took about two years. <laughs> and so I was surprised. Um, but anyway, each of us were unit heads of a particular area, elder law, housing law, um, family, uh, consumer, and then employment law. And uh, you know, as far as collaboration, it was so important the team approach so crucial because we as attorneys you know this is going to be a project that's in addition to the work we're already doing and you know our regular 
um, caseloads that we had. So um, we all got, we each gathered a team of our own. Um, we had, of course, our unit members to help us, and all of us had at least one judge or former judge uh, on our team that had the expertise in that area. And we had one or more private lawyers. We had a pre-law group at one of our universities. So we had um, college students from there helping with um, just creation of materials and working with the uh, uploading to the classroom. And then of course we had law students uh, and actually, in some cases, we even had um, a media colleague or two. Um, the law students were crucial, of course, because they, although they didn't know the A to J author software coming into it, we did have an IT staff person who was able to help us start with that. But the law students learned the program, and so they were they were really crucial because that gave us as lawyers, although I was trying to start to learn the, the A to J author, it was nice to have someone who I could collaborate with and they could really do all of that part. And as law students, the added benefit was that they learned um, that area of the law that, that they were working on. So, you know, all of these people brought something to the process. And, and I will say that um, although we we each had a team and we were an overall team under the, the grant, it was a lot of individual work for each of the people who were on the team. You know, kind of everybody had an assignment. And then, of course, um, in the end, it was the five of us who really had to make it happen, get it finished, you know, do all the testing that needed to be done and so forth. Um, and, and that, it, it was challenging. Um, I'd say there were two crucial pieces. Um, one of those being the law student team who helped with the A to J author guided interviews, um, because our staff, um, one, we had one person who, um, had done that for us and he was, you know, quite overloaded. And so that was a somewhat of a lengthy process, I would say. Hey, Susan. Yep. Yes. Did the students do it as part of a class or just um, sort of a volunteer experience? Um, they actually did it. Um, they were um, working for a um, um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, about the name of it, but one of the lo uh, local law firms in South Carolina, um, the Nelson Mullins law firm has a center for um, uh, students to work at the law school. And these were students who actually were working um, during the summer and during an additional semester at school. So it was not technically part of a class that they actually got credit for. Okay. Um, but it was a start for our law school there to get into that process and they ended up um, going ahead and getting their own server because one of the problems that we ran into was that they would come over to our office in Columbia. We're a statewide um, legal aid uh, law firm and so our state capital Columbia is sort of centrally located and that's where um, one of our two law schools is, but it was a little um, difficult for them to come over to our office and spend um, the lengthy amount of time. A couple of them were in summer school and things like that, and so uh, so it got a little bit tedious, I think, really for them to come over and we'd go over things and we'd edit and so forth, and they would go back and work on it, and then we'd come back. So it was really great for them to be able to have their own um, platform over at the law school and just work on it there. And then we could as individual um, team leaders go and meet with them at the law school. And it just was a lot more convenient for them. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we, um, cause that actually slowed our project down a little bit just because of our one staff member being so overloaded. And once the, 
law school um, and the Nelson Mullins project did that, it, I think it moved a lot quicker. Um, unfortunately, as a side note on that, um, the first guided interview that we did was the one that I was involved with, which was the debt collection defense uh, classroom. And it got, we got very complicated with that because part of what we wanted these classrooms to do was be a way for uh, pro bono uh, attorneys to take cases and learn, be able to have a classroom that they could go to at their convenience to learn how to do it. So um, when we started the guided interview for defending a debt collection case, we were adding affirmative defenses and counterclaims and things like that. And it was great, but we finally decided that if a regular, just you know, self-represented person was trying to use it, it would be impossible. So we sort of have that one um, that we're hoping to finish and uh, upload to the classroom. And we ended up just going with a much simpler uh, version uh, on the debt collection defense. So, but yeah, they had quite the uh, baptism by fire with that first guided interview that they tried. <laughs> and after that, they did this one for um, getting your landlord to make repairs. I think it was a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. Um, and I think the other thing besides the, the guided interview assistance that we got was that as part of our grant, we did, um, asked for and, and received the ability to um, have a third party contractor to create the animated videos. And so um, that was, you know, a separate contract, but I think was really crucial to the whole um, project um, for a lot of reasons. And you can see here on the uh, classroom on getting your landlord to make repairs, um, our little character, and his name is Clark. So all of our classrooms start with a Clark video. And these are like a very short video so that if someone wants to know how to get their landlord to make repairs, if they at least just watch the video, they're going to learn a lot. And as we all know, in something like a, an online classroom, It'd be nice if people got all the way through all the material that you have, but um, that doesn't always happen. And we figured that if we had front and center in our introductory page, the cartoon video, hopefully people will click on that and they'll at least learn some basics of what they um, need to be able to do. So Jessica, why don't we go ahead and run this uh, one video, if that's okay. Sure, let me expand this one. Um, let me see about the audio. Yeah, let's see. Sorry, one second. Let me start it over again. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, of course, there's the obligatory uh, disclaimer. <laughs> I think it's not playing because of the oh. um, right there we go. disclaimer. There you go. If you rent a home in South Carolina, your landlord has an obligation to keep that home safe and healthy. This is sometimes called the warranty of habitability. This means that there can be no threats to health and safety or other serious problems with the home. There must be access to essential services like water and heating and important appliances. Examples of unsafe or unhealthy conditions include no heat or hot water, leaky plumbing, mold, pests, missing door locks, and electrical problems. If your house is unsafe or unhealthy because of a condition like this, your landlord has to fix it. It's the law. First of all, as long as you are living in the home, it's best to keep paying rent. If you withhold rent, your landlord may file for eviction. You will then have to raise the issues of repairs while defending an eviction case. Step one, notify the landlord. Send a polite and clearly written letter to your landlord asking for repairs. Include a list of all of the repairs needed, when the damage occurred, and a reasonable deadline to make the repairs. Usually, it's best to give your landlord at least 14 days. Your letter also needs to say what you're going to do if repairs aren't made, so you'll need to make this decision now. You have two options. 
if you want to leave, you have this option if the problems with your home materially affect health and safety. They can't be minor problems. You also should have given your landlord written notice of the problems and at least 14 days to fix them. It's best to send any letter certified mail or send it with your rent check so you have proof the landlord received it. Be sure to keep a copy. You can create a letter using a tool on SCLS's website. If you want to stay and try to make your landlord fix your home, you can file a lawsuit asking the court to order your landlord to make repairs and possibly to award you damages. You can do this with or without a lawyer. You can create papers to file in court using a tool on SCLS's website. Step 2. Evidence. You need to make a record of the problems with your home. The best way to do this is to take lots of pictures. Make sure that you document all of the problems and that there is plenty of light to see the problems clearly. Record the date that you took the photos. Step 3. If the landlord does nothing. If you decide to leave, you can simply move out and stop paying rent. You don't need to file anything in court, but it is an option. There's more info on that on SCLS's website. Once you move, you should write to the landlord to ask for your security deposit and prepaid rent back. A sample letter is on SCLS's website. If you decide to stay, you can file a complaint with the court. You will need to be served on your landlord. The court can have this done for you for a small fee, or you can have it done yourself. Once your landlord is served, they have 30 days to respond, call, and answer. Once the court has received the answer, they will schedule a trial. If the condition of the house is very bad, for example, you don't have heat, electricity, or running water, you can ask the court for an emergency hearing to decide whether your rent should be reduced or if your landlord should be ordered to make repairs immediately. When you come to court, make sure to bring all the evidence you collected. Print out any pictures you took. If you have any witnesses, make sure they come too. You won't be able to use written statements from witnesses. SCLS has created an online resource to help you take action to get repairs from your landlord. Here you can create the court forms you need, letters to your landlord requesting repairs, contact information for city and county agencies, and more. Okay, thanks uh, for running that. Um... And hopefully y'all enjoyed the little video. Um, we have found in our testing that uh, not only is the, the animated video helpful to the self-represented folks, it was also helpful in getting uh, our volunteer lawyers to be interested in this um, you know, particular subject matter of each of these cases. And in fact, some of the feedback was almost immediately uh, they would say, well, yeah, I think I could do one of those because, you know, for lawyers, you really just need a little bit of instruction about how to do the case and you know, what might happen in court and so forth. So the um, it was really a twofold positive, the marketing to the volunteer attorneys, but also just a, a quick way to get some information to the self-represented folks. Um, so you, you may have noticed, and we have learned along the way, and we'll hopefully not make this mistake again, but you may have noticed the dates on some of those papers were 2017, and here we are in 2019. So that's something that we learned to um, not put the year <laughs> uh, in the video so they wouldn't look like they were uh, some old version. Um, but anyway, so we, we've learned along the way and the video mentioned some different forms and you'll see over on the left, um, second from the bottom, there's a forms and advanced materials. So that's a place where um, the folks can go and find a sample letter to the landlord and, and things like that. So that's uh, why we start every classroom uh, with that video. And that's, a, there's exception of one, uh, uh, subject matter where it just wasn't appropriate to have a cartoon because it was related to um, domestic violence. So we didn't use a, a cartoon on that one. And then we actually added a couple of related classrooms and ended up with seven classrooms. And so two of those are still kind of a work in progress and they do not have the, um, the cartoon video. 
Um, and a little bit about that process of creating the animation with the third party. We used um, Law Hub, which some of you may have heard of. Um, they did a fantastic job, but that's a bit of a process. And one thing we learned there is that unlike with the Learn the Law classroom, where you can constantly be changing and adding and updating, which is one of the things I like most about the platform, with the animated videos, there comes a point where you can't change it anymore without having, you know, to incur additional expense. So it's important to um, know that when you're starting out uh, doing the scripting of it. And uh, for us, uh, this was the first time we had done this character thing. And so uh, Law Hub gave us three characters that they I had come up with and we were able to choose from the three characters. So, you know, as a team, we had to come to an agreement uh, on that. And uh, then of course, we had to give him a name. And so that's where all worked out pretty good. We, um, it, it is not a um, uh, gender neutral character technically, I suppose, um, but it, it's, you know, it's working out just fine for us uh, on that, uh, in that regard. Um, I guess the other thing that I'd like to talk about is the fact that we as lawyers, I mean, some of us, you know, had some uh, technical skill and knowledge going into the project, but some didn't. And I can definitely say that even your low tech lawyers that you're working with, um, they can do this, learn the law platform, or at least they can contribute to it in some ways. It's not at all hard to upload material to it. Um, and that's something that's, you know, for most people is easy to learn if you can convince them to, to open their mind to the possibilities. Um, and, you know, Again, what I really like about Learn the Law is that it, you can constantly adjust and adapt the online classroom. Unlike with the, <clears throat> the animated video, which once you have completed that, you can't really go back and change it without um, having the cost to you know, really do it all over again. With this classroom, uh, you can you know, take a whole section out and replace it. And we actually had that experience with our classroom on uh, guardianship, because in South Carolina, our guardianship law change was completely revamped. And that went into effect in December of last year. And we launched these classrooms in the spring of this year. And so we, we knew that that was coming, we didn't, you know, early on know exactly what was going to happen with it, because that is a process when you have a whole section of your law that's changing. So we had to be ready for that and adapt to it. And in fact, I think um, one of the videos in that classroom, we had to just completely redo, but it's not that hard to do um, to just stick it right back in the classroom and have your most current information. And also you can just add things along the way, not necessarily substituting and updating, but, you know, add uh, something new that you may uh, have on, on a particular subject matter. And another uh, thing on the Learn the Law platform is that anybody can, you know, for the most part, use what others have done and just sort of make it their own. And I think that's, that's a nice feature uh, as well. So I, I think that's about all I have on uh, sort of the process of it. Um, it was really a, it was a great process and we've actually, um, because it's been so well received in our, our communities and the testing has gone well, we have applied for another uh, TIG grant to expand that. And also right now we're creating um, disaster uh, relief um, classrooms and doing the uh, animated videos. And we're just actually using some funding we have for disaster relief 
instead of the TIG grant. So we were able to kind of keep on keep on going with another project. In terms of your marketing, what did you guys do to get these out to the people? Or is it still sort of in the testing, um, like beta phase? Yeah, it's, um, we pretty much completed the testing. Um, we're still you know, trying to test along the way because we have added a, you know, a new thing here and there. Um, we actually had a, um, a marketing firm to assist us with that. And so we were able to create um, you know, posters and flyers and so forth. Um, we have, uh, of course, you know, posted on our social media. And then we, the marketing firm is um, just in the last couple of months in their phase of connecting the subject matter with all of the uh, media outlets uh, around our state. So uh, we don't have at South Carolina Legal Services an actual um, you know, marketing um, staff person or department. And so um, that's why we have included in the TIG grant application uh, funds for that to be done. Because if, if we had left it up to ourselves to market it, <laughs> it would not have uh, been done quite as well. So so that was great that we were able to um, pay an outside firm, a third party to um, get that going for us. And of course we're involved with that because we're, um, you know, doing interviews, making comments and so forth. But, um, you know, we're using, using the professionals for that part. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. And I will say we did um, present these to um, a CLE uh, up in Greenville, South Carolina. They have an end of the year CLE for the uh, bar members there. And it's a huge event with like 600 lawyers. That's huge in South Carolina to have 600 at an event. And, um, and so I was able to do a presentation there and it was very well received and uh, is um, now you know, connected with the pro bono website of a, a newly formed uh, foundation, pro bono foundation with the Greenville County Bar. So um, it's it's been very well received. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience about Law Hub. Do you have the URL for that one or do you know their website? Otherwise I can do a quick Google search. Oh, uh, you know, um, I think you can do a Google search or you can just uh, email me. I may have, let me have that. Um, it's Adam Stofsky is his name that's in charge of that. Okay. Um, okay. Let me just, you, I can, uh, I I'll don't know that he, oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's the lawhub.net is the original um, email or um, website I had for them. I don't know if that's still correct or not. Um, but uh, uh, they're terrific, and so. Okay, I'll put your email on the um on the la on the last slide, and if anyone has questions, you can email Susan for that contact after. Thank you. Um, I had a question in terms of maintenance and sort of keeping these up and keeping them going. So you mentioned that you applied for a new TIG. But what, mm -hmm. um, what if any, do you have sort of as a, a maintenance plan um, to keep, you know, making sure these are still good and, and um, building new ones? Is it just sort of just stick with right. additional funding? Uh, yeah, there's that. And then we have a, um, our web content uh, developer who was kind of in charge of the project. He was... Um, sort of hurting the five unit heads that were doing the classrooms. And so as we create them, that's why we're having a unit head be in charge of each one, because even if, um, you know, a unit head leaves the law firm or something, that that person will always be replaced. And so um, it's part of their you know, job description to keep all of our um, web content up to date. And then we have... Um, our web content person who's in charge of that overall, who um, keeps us uh, in line with that every year. 
That's smart to always have at least somebody that's that's looking out for Yeah, it. because yeah. I mean, you know, we do have a uh, turnover and um that that is I mean, it's a great question. It's something that you really you know, need to be concerned with because you don't want to just put content out there and then just forget about it. Um it's important to keep it up to date and and again, that's why I love this learn the law platform because it's very easy for someone like me um, who's, you know, busy with a caseload and, and other work and other projects to um, go and look at it and, um, you know, and update it or change it. And I even at uh, one presentation that I did, somebody pointed out to me like a misspelling of a word. You know, you think you've got everything <laughs> you know, looked over again and again and edited, and uh, I still had someone find one little misspelling uh, of a word, which was great because I was able to just go right in uh, and change it. So um, it's very, very user-friendly in that way. Thank you. Um, so you talked about your coalition in the beginning, sort of your partners that you work with, private attorneys, a judge, law students, that kind of thing. How did you guys start? Um, like building such a robust sort of subject matter expert pool to draw from? Is it just uh, unique to South Carolina? Was it a particular need in your community that um, that's an interesting mix of, you know, private, the judiciary, you got the legal aid and law students? Right. Well, one thing is uh, that in South Carolina, our pro bono program is uh, run by the South Carolina Bar Association, whereas in a lot of states it's run by the legal aid organization. And so that is very helpful um, in our, uh, of course we already have a strong partnership with uh, the bar and they were actually very helpful in this with their um, media that they have. They have the ability to um, create videos and so forth and so, um, they were helpful with that, but also they had an interest in having this content for uh, the pro bono volunteers, and so that, of course, was very helpful. Having each of us as unit heads be in charge of a particular classroom was really a great way to get that collaboration started because we're doing it in our own focus area, an area where we're connected with other members of the legal community and the judiciary and the and the bar and the court administration and so forth, so that it's um, it's not a huge challenge to make the connection with them. I think the challenge comes with the you know creating the actual team, and and that's why I say that. Uh, in a lot of ways, we were a team, but working individually, sort of everybody had an assignment um, because there's so much work to be done. And, and I say that it, it was shocking to me how long it took, um, but everybody has a piece of it, but then you have to put it all together. And so for my classroom, um, I had um, one judge who happened to be the one who taught this subject matter to the other judges. And so he was very gracious to review the classroom for me and you know, make any suggestions to make sure that I was you know, getting the process right and the law right and that all the other information from our partners and you know, the guided interview and so forth um, made sense. And so uh, that was really helpful and I just happened to through um, just my regular practice and working with our um, legal you know community partners all the time you know was able to make that uh, that connection so we we didn't have a lot of um, you know like team meetings so to speak and that was fine I mean it worked out um, everybody's busy and it's hard to get people together for um, meetings and it worked out very well for people to work on individual assignments that was sort of within their wheelhouse. Did you use any special tools since you didn't have sort of the in-person everybody working around a table like did you use Google Docs or just email and phone calls kind of thing to get everything um, coordinated? Yeah I think um, of course, since we started this process, um, our 
um, our ability to have virtual meetings and you know meetings with um, other collaborators on Skype and things like that where we can actually see each other and all that that has vastly improved and so when we started out it was mostly um, conference call um, emails and that sort of thing and then as a team of us five unit heads um, because it was a TIG grant and we had reporting to do and um, you know, decisions to be made on things like the third party contractors and that sort of thing um, we had some in-person meetings um, and each of us had some in-person meetings with our team and or team members, but as an overall um, team of the team leaders, um, I would say we had a meeting maybe uh, in person probably like two times a year and the rest were um, by phone. Cause, you know, we were doing a lot of um, uh, filming of videos and things like that as well. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If you have questions, you can put them into the question or the chat panel and I'll read them out to Susan or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Let's see if we got it. And then if, um, if not, or there aren't, or um, Susan's done a really good job of covering sort of the learn the law experience and explaining how it's really successful in South Carolina. So um, thank you. Susan for uh, joining us. Um, um, can I just ask, may I ask the audience a question? Um, yeah, feel free. I'm just curious um, if anybody has any input on this um, because one of the things that we did in the classroom, we um, got together and made some courtroom videos, kind of some courtroom scenes, like here's what a typical case looks like. And it was not cartoon it was with real people and like a real judge you know sitting up on the bench and that sort of thing and what we want to do next is to make that more of a um uh you know multiple camera angle virtual reality type of courtroom experience and i'm just wondering if anyone out there has um, done anything like that and uh, if you have any um you know, thoughts on that kind of a process. While we're waiting for anyone to pop up and uh, offer any insight, um, I think I've heard of law schools doing that in terms of like training for moot court or um, trial advocacy, sort of giving people um, a more robust uh, virtual reality experience of what it's like to be in front of the judge. I can't think of a right. Story. Well. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to do that. When we um, showed these classrooms to our pro bono board of the South Carolina Bar, um, they were very interested in that same thing, you know, kind of the courtroom experience. And, you know, um, before you can, in South Carolina, and I'm sure this is true in other states, before you can, once you're licensed, before you can uh, represent someone in court on your own, you have to have a certain number of trial experiences and a judge has to sign off that you were you know, there in the courtroom observing the actual trial. And we've gone more and more towards being able to do some of that with just like an online uh, experience, but they haven't gone totally that way. And so they were very interested in um, the virtual reality courtroom idea from that perspective. Because it, it is very difficult um, sometimes to get that courtroom experience, that trial experience from start to finish. Um, you've got to, you know, find a case. The trial has to actually start. It has to not be settled, you know, at the close of evidence or anything like that. And so it can be kind of difficult to get. So we're hoping that this might be something that can be uh, helpful in the future in that regard. I think TNT is running all the law and orders if people want to just watch those from start to finish. <laughs> you can watch, you know, all 30 years of law and order. Um, uh, we did get a comment from Andrea in Virginia. She said that they haven't done anything like that yet, but um, it sounds like a great idea. So, okay. All no, right. no other feedback. I guess everyone's you're you're on the cutting edge there of uh, video <laughs> technology. <laughs> Well, we'll see. <laughs> well, um, again, thank you, Susan, for presenting for us today. 
And um, if anyone has questions, here's your last chance to put them in the question panel or the chat panel. Um, and our emails are on the screen. Our next webinar is the first Thursday in September, September 5th, 2019. Um, I see we have a couple of new people on, so uh, if you're interested, we run uh, a webinar. Sometimes we have guest speakers like this, and most of the time it's sort of uh, learning about A to J author, a specific topic, usually 15 to 30 minutes long, um, and the videos are recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. So I'll get to work uh, editing and posting this video uh, this week. And um, if you have colleagues that might be interested in this, you can email me for the link to the YouTube channel or just keep an eye on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash author, and I will post uh, this video shortly. So thank okay. you all for attending. Hey, Jessica, thanks so much for having me. And I do invite any of the attendees, feel free to call me or email me uh, if you want to talk more about this type of project. Be glad to share. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for attending, and hopefully I'll see you next month. Have a great weekend.